Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Diane Smith, and I'm a senior producer of programming at CTN. And I welcome you to this uh, lunchtime lecture and live taping of Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, which will air on CTN and will also be available for download. The question today really is traffic strangling Connecticut's economy. We've heard that the state economy can't grow without better bridges and highways, major investments in mass transit, reinvigorating our ports, and making improvements to Bradley International Airport. Earlier generations, much earlier, understood the value of transportation as they transformed this state from a network of colonial towns into an industrial powerhouse by creating ways to get around. Today we start with the history of transportation in this state, and then we ask you to join in on the conversation when our panel joins me on stage to talk about transportation today and tomorrow. But first we start with historian and transportation engineer Richard DeLuca and author, and if you like, you'd be able to uh, buy his book right after the talk today. He's written a fascinating history of turnpikes, steamboats, canals, railroads, and trolleys in Connecticut, many of which were gone by the time most of us moved here, the canal and the steamboats and um, very romantic era that he's going to talk about. His book is called Post Roads and Iron Horses. It's the first one really to deal in detail with the development of a transportation network that helped define Connecticut and indeed shape New England. Richard DeLuca earned a Master of Science degree in transportation and planning from the University of Connecticut. He has 10 years of experience in the field of engineering as a transportation planner with the Connecticut Department of Transportation and with the Central Connecticut Regional Planning. Planning Authority. For the past 10 years, he's been at work on a two-volume history of Connecticut transportation from the colonial period to the present. The first volume, Post Road and Iron Horses, was published by Wesleyan University Press in 2011, and it covers the history of Connecticut transportation from colonial times through the age of steam. A second volume on transportation in the 20th century is in progress, but Richard takes time out today to talk to us. Richard, welcome. Glad to Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome. Welcome to the old State House, and uh, thank you, Diane, and my thanks to, to uh, Sally Whipple and the old State House for organizing this event today. Um, I would like to begin by setting the stage for a discussion of probably more recent transportation events by telling you a little bit about Connecticut's transportation past and in particular, talking about three factors that still influence Connecticut transportation today. Those three factors are the landscape, transportation technology, and public policy. So let's start with the landscape and with that age-old question that arises every spring here in Connecticut, like life eternal. Yankees or Red Sox? <laughs> okay, now that may seem a silly place to start a talk about Connecticut transportation, but it illustrates an important point. From its beginnings, as Dutch traders made their way up from New Amsterdam and English colonists came down from Massachusetts Bay, Connecticut's position between New York and Boston has played an important role in the state's transportation history. Beginning with the establishment of the King's Best Highway in 1673, three post routes developed through colonial Connecticut. First, the Upper Post Road, which ran from New York through New Haven, up to Hartford and Springfield and on to Boston. Next, the Lower Post Road, from New Haven through New London to Providence. And then third, the middle route to Boston, which ran diagonally across eastern Connecticut from Hartford. These three routes, which today we call I-95, I-91, and I-84, have been the three-pronged spine of overland transportation in Connecticut since the days of the first post rider. Now, these three historic corridors illustrate an important phenomenon about Connecticut transportation. Namely, that Connecticut roads serve a significant traffic passing through the state, drawn by the external attractors of New York, Boston, and Providence. Notice, too, that the three routes, then and now, share a common link from New York to New Haven 
through which traffic using any one of the three prongs must pass. This fact of geography allowed the New York and New Haven Railroad to grow into a transportation monopoly. And in the early years of the automobile, it created such a traffic problem on the post road that the solutions brought forth both the Merritt Parkway and the Connecticut Turnpike. Now this slide shows the network of graded dirt turnpikes that evolved in Connecticut during the early decades of the 19th century. And it illustrates another way that the landscape has influenced Connecticut transportation. In this case, the man-made landscape of the more than 100 separate towns into which this small state of ours had been divided by 1800. The need to provide access to market towns around the state from so many small town centers resulted in the construction of some 1,600 miles of turnpike toll roads, more turnpikes per square mile than any other state in the Union. Now, during the turnpike era, Connecticut chartered more than 100 private companies to fund, build, and maintain this first transportation network of the industrial era. At a time when the lack of good roads threatened the ability of the new republic to function even as one nation, these dirt toll roads promoted stagecoach travel and wagon service sufficient to allow market capitalism to take hold and a national economy to begin. Yet in Connecticut, only one turnpike company in 10 made any money for its investors. Okay, this one last example before we leave our discussion of the land. Forgive me, but I'm, I'm going to hold this because the light just isn't the best down there. Um, on this map of the state's rivers, notice the course of the Farmington River. Diverted by glacial debris deposited ages ago, the course of the Farmington River runs not due south as the state's other rivers, but turns to the north and east flowing into the Connecticut River at Windsor. Now, this geologic anomaly brought about perhaps the state's most famous transportation project, the Farmington Canal. Hoping to replicate the success of New York's Erie Canal, New Haven businessmen joined forces in the 1820s to build the man-made river that nature had denied them and thereby create a corridor for inland trade that the port of New Haven lacked. By extending the canal into Massachusetts to the Connecticut River at Northampton, New Haven also hoped to divert the trade of the upper Connecticut River Valley away from its rival, Hartford. Now, as you can see from the facts on this slide, the Farmington Canal was a notable engineering accomplishment. The canal operated for 10 shipping seasons, and allowed commerce in the Farmington Valley to flourish and many merchants and shippers to turn a tidy profit in the process. Yet the canal company itself made a profit in only one year out of 10 and in the end cost its shareholders $1.3 million in total losses. Can you see a pattern here? Private companies chartered by the state to build and maintain turnpike and canal infrastructures and in return charge a toll for their use made little or no return on their investments, while those who depended on the infrastructure, merchants, shippers, and stagecoach companies did quite well. All right, let's switch to Long Island Sound and the advent of the external combustion steam engine, which revolutionized both transportation and industrial production in the 19th century. Scheduled steamboat service first appeared on Long Island Sound in 1815, with the New York Company formed by Robert Fulton and Robert Livingston running steamers between New York City and New Haven, and also between New Haven and New London. Now, the Fulton Group 
operated under a monopoly from the state of New York, and competitors wishing to reciprocate and enter New York waters were required to purchase a license from and share their profits with Fulton's company. Now, operators in New Jersey and Connecticut protested the arrangement for nearly a decade before a lawsuit finally decided the matter. In the landmark case Gibbons v. Ogden, the U.S. Supreme Court in 1824 struck down the Fulton monopoly as unconstitutional, making open and free competition the norm in interstate commerce. Now, following the decision, steamboating flourished on Long Island Sound and along the Connecticut River to Hartford, with Connecticut companies providing both daytime and overnight service to New York City from numerous Connecticut ports. The spur of competition also spurred advances in steamboat technology as companies outdid one another to build larger, faster, and more luxurious steamers. Now, after Gibbons and Ogden, any further attempt at monopoly seemed rather un-American. So when the Connecticut River Company of Hartford was granted a charter, uh, also in 1824, to own and operate canals on the upper Connecticut River and a, street, a uh, fleet of steamboats that would utilize those canals, cries of monopoly from Boston merchants was enough to kill their effort. Now, just a, a side, uh, I just found out this morning that this building was here in um, 1824, and in fact, the Connecticut River Company held some of their first coordinating meetings in this building, and perhaps in this very room. Okay, enter the railroad. The railroad reduced friction achieved by running metal wheels over metal rails, and that allowed a steam locomotive to pull a relatively heavy load with little power. This application of steam power to land transportation provided just the low-cost, high-volume transport that the Industrial Revolution required. There was one rub, however. The railroad is unique among all modes of transportation in that one corporation owns both the track and station infrastructure and the common carrier or the vehicles that run on it. So by that definition and the definition that the Connecticut River Company was trying to establish in, uh, on the upper river here in Hartford, the railroad is a transportation monopoly. The first railroads opened in Connecticut in the late 1830s, and by 1900, as you can see here on the slide, Connecticut corporations uh, had built 1,000 miles of rail line in the state. As in the Turnpike era, Connecticut was so saturated with rail coverage that it was said that no town was more than 14 miles from a rail line. Now, from the beginning, rail builders were preoccupied with establishing a connection between New York and Boston. And in doing so, they repeated the history of the post era. The first rail route to Boston was along the heavily populated route of the upper post road. The second over the shoreline route of the lower post road to Providence, while the last most direct rail route to Boston ran diagonally across the hilly terrain of eastern Connecticut, though not from Hartford this time, but from Middletown. And it was along this so-called airline route to Boston that Connecticut railroading reached the peak of its performance. By 1886, the New England Limited train that you see here had reduced travel time between New York and Boston from six days in the pre-turnpike era of the post rider to six hours, about a century later. Following the Civil War, as construction of individual rail lines continued, rail corporations began to consolidate into statewide and even regional systems. This consolidation was led in Connecticut by the New York and New Haven, 
the railroad that controlled, if you remember, that common link between New York City and New Haven that was common to all three post routes. In 1872, the New York and New Haven merged with the Hartford and New Haven to create the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad, or what we today more simply refer to as the New Haven. By 1900, through lease, stock, or outright purchase, the New Haven controlled most rail lines in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and southern Massachusetts. And to this point, the New Haven remained both a strong and solvent company, steadily improving service and rolling stock, and rewarding its stockholders with consistent dividends of 10%. Perhaps monopoly was not such a dirty word after all. But as rail lines coalesced into regional systems, parent companies like the New Haven caught the attention of Wall Street bankers, whose stock and bond offerings were an essential element of that expansion. So for the New Haven Railroad, the banker of record, pictured on the left here, was John Pierpont Morgan, J.P. Morgan, a Hartford native who had risen through the world of New York banking to become a nationally recognized kingpin of corporate finance, a deal maker, we would call him today. Morgan's plan for the New Haven was nothing less than the control of all privately owned transportation companies in New England, which included, of course, railroads, coastal steamers, and also the emerging network of electric street railways, or trolleys. With influence that extended as far as the Oval Office, Morgan gave little thought to the possibility of being perhaps prosecuted for restraint of trade under the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. To make his dream a reality, Morgan needed Charles S. Mellon, the fellow you see there on the right, a railroad man of similar conviction who became president of the New Haven in 1903. And over the next decade, Morgan and Mellon spent $204 million on acquiring new railroad, steamboat, and trolley lines, in addition to $120 million improving the system itself, increasing the capitalization of the company more than four times in the process. But by 1913, the New Haven's reach extended to most rail, steamer, and trolley lines throughout New England. Unfortunately, Morgan and Mellon accomplished their expansion in a way that was as deceptive as it was aggressive. Using the latest concepts in corporate financing, the holding company and the interlocking directorate, the New Haven Railroad shuffled assets among more than 300 subsidiary corporations in order to create, on paper at least, the profits necessary to finance all of these purchases. An inevitable investigation of the New, Haven, the New Haven's finances by the Interstate Commerce Commission eventually followed, during which J.P. Morgan died on, while on vacation in Rome. Morgan's body was returned to New York for services and brought to Hartford by a special New Haven train for burial at Cedar Hill Cemetery. With his ally gone, Mellon resigned from the New Haven, exchanging his testimony before the commission for immunity from prosecution. And if any of this sounds familiar, I think I know why. When all was said and done, the commission exposed what it called, quote, one of the most glaring instances of maladministration in the history of American railroading. So under threat of a federal lawsuit, the New Haven sold off its more controversial out-of-state assets and became a more or less Connecticut company once again. Oh, my uh, apologies here. There are supposed to be some numbers um, on top of that picture. Uh, you're going to have to use your imaginations and listen. Um, the point here is that the railroad and the Industrial Revolution 
that have made possible change Connecticut dramatically during the 19th century. What began as an agricultural state with only 10 percent of its population, or roughly 25,000 people, living in a handful of cities scattered around the state. A century later, it was one of the most highly industrialized, highly, highly urbanized states in the nation, with 500,000 people, more than one half of its total population of nearly a million, living in urban centers on only 10 percent of the state's total land area. But consider, all, consider this, all of the transportation that we've been talking about, from the stagecoach to the canal, steamboat, railroad, and street railway, were what we today would call mass transportation, right? They're modes where one travels with other people along someone else's route and according to someone else's timetable. The only option for an individual looking to travel on his own terms in 1900 was the same as it had been in 1800, a horse, a buggy, and a dirt road. So enter yet another new technology, the internal combustion gasoline engine. This latest source of mechanical power was put to work on the problem of individual transportation, and soon the horseless carriage made it possible for individuals to travel at speeds of in the tens of miles per hour, then putting individual travel on a par with mass transportation for the first time in a century. All that was needed for this auto mobility to become a viable mode of transportation was a network of paved roads that made travel practical the year round, as it obviously wasn't here in Hartford in 1907, presumably after a recent rainstorm. So in 1895, Connecticut created a highway commission whose job it was to develop a program for the improvement of public highways in the state, but to be funded this time around not by private enterprise, but by the public corporation we call the state of Connecticut. It was the first time in Connecticut history that the state had taken responsibility for financing transportation improvements of any kind. Now, this combination of paved roads and public money and the change in public policy that it represented turned Connecticut transportation history on its head. Suddenly, the state was as anxious to leave behind the abuses of private monopoly as its many urban residents were to leave behind its crowded cities. And as road improvements progressed and the price of the automobile fell, the move to the suburbs began. So in 19, by 1913, Connecticut designated its first state highway system, which consisted of 14 trunk line routes, totaling again about 1,000 miles. Three years later, Congress in Washington enacted the nation's first Federal Aid Highway Act, which gave the Bureau of Public Roads responsibility for a system of two-lane interstate highways, whose improvement was also going to be funded by taxpayer money. Now, this next slide shows changes in the Hartford streetscape by 1925 as a result of the automobile. It's taken outside the Asylum Hill train station, and the picture, as you can see, includes a steam locomotive, two electric trolley cars, several automobiles, a motor bus of the New England Transportation Company, even a few pedestrians. And if you look into the shadows, you can see a truck and a motorcycle. Surely this is what multimodal heaven must look like. But looks can be deceiving. The railroad, the trolley cars, and the motor bus were all owned by the New Haven Railroad, which despite its reduced size still carried on its books $225 million of debt accumulated during the Morgan Mellon expansion. Unable any longer to even cover the interest on that debt, the New Haven finally slipped into bankruptcy in 1935. The bankruptcy of the New Haven coincided with the advent of a new kind of roadway, 
the Limited Access Highway, which first appeared in Connecticut with the Merritt Parkway, which is pictured here about 1940. And as you can see, we're down at the state line there with New York. With access restricted to specific points along its route, the Limited Access Highway allowed cars and trucks to realize their true high-speed potential. The Limited Access Highway was, in fact, a, um, a railroad perfectly designed for the auto age. No sooner had the New Haven emerged from reorganization in 1947 when the still private corporation faced competition from the limited access highways being built throughout the region and from the expansion of commercial aviation, that other new mode of travel that we haven't talked about that was made possible by the internal combustion engine. The New Haven filed bankruptcy for the last time in 1961, after which pieces of the system, mainly the commuter rail service between New York and New Haven and bus service in some Connecticut cities, were placed under state control. Now, these publicly owned transit services continue to this day, subsidized by a combination of federal and state funds. So in concluding, with the creation of the Departments of Transportation at both the state and federal levels in the late 1960s, the public corporation we call the State of Connecticut achieved what Morgan and Mellon had not even imagined, a monopoly over all modes of transportation in the state. And the story of Connecticut transportation, which I'm sure we're going to talk about during the panel discussion, over the last four decades has been how best to utilize public money to maintain, rebuild, and expand these transportation services. And I'm going to leave the story there and give the podium back to Diane. And I thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to have all the panelists come up. Commissioner and Jim Cameron, please come up. Um, well, we thought that uh, the history was very interesting, but what we like to do here in our uh, lecture series at the Old State House is kind of bring the issues uh, up into the uh, present and see how they're affecting us today. So we're going to talk about transportation, a big issue this year. And joining us, I'm very pleased to say, is the Commissioner of the Department of Transportation, James P. Redeker. Thank you so much. Uh, for those of you that are not sure about this, the DOT has six bureaus, Aviation and Ports, Finance and Administration, Highway Operations, Policy and Planning, Engineering and Construction, and Public Transportation, employs about 3,000 people across the state. The Commissioner previously was Chief of the DOT's Bureau of Public Transportation, and Commissioner Redeker joined the DOT in 2008 after a 30-year career with the New Jersey Department of Transportation and New Jersey Transit, which is the third largest transit agency in the country. The New Haven line of Metro North carries some 35 million passengers a year. One of them has been Jim Cameron. Uh, when Jim felt that Metro North service was lacking, he did more than get mad. He did something about it. He joined the Connecticut Metro North Rail Commuter Council, and he is now the chairman of that organization. He is a member of the representative town meeting in Darien, is program director of the town's TV station, and is the author of the newspaper column, Talking Transportation, that appears in over 20 newspapers in our state. Jim Jim, thank you for being with us. Pleasure. Commissioner, um, as a person who spends about half my time here in the Hartford area and about half my time in Fairfield County, I have to ask you, Fairfield County's traffic has always been a problem, continues to be a problem, and I wonder if having a governor who is from Fairfield County and a lot of his administration is from Fairfield County, whether that has changed the focus of what the DOT is doing at all. Well, I think that the focus for transportation is a vision for the future, and that is a different uh, viewpoint for me. Um, coming into a state and, and recognizing that around the country um, we've seen a constriction of federal dollars and limited state dollars, um, this administration has a very different view, which is a, a long-range view, a view for future generations, um, and a plan to invest today in an infrastructure, in rolling stock, as in trains and buses, uh, and in expanded transit and expanded highway and capacity investments that will serve um, today's commuters, but also uh, the future. 
that's not to say that our problems aren't significant and that our, our challenges in terms of congestion and, and the flow of goods and people isn't significant. But um, we have an administration that, that gets it. Uh, we've seen a significant investment just in the first biennium of this administration in state dollars to advance uh, key initiatives. And um, there are many of those that will sustain the growth that this state deserves and needs as an economic engine. And it's really linking uh, our transportation system and our environment and our economy mm -hmm. in a way that's never before been linked so that we can uh, do the right thing environmentally, do the right thing for travel, uh, and invest to grow our economy. And I think that that's what's different here. Um, and it's not an investment strategy for one, it's an investment strategy for all. Um, and I, for one, am not a Fairfield County resident. I'm a Cheshire resident. And mm -hmm. um, this is a plan that will serve, frankly, the entire state. So uh, I'm pleased to be uh, in the position of really hosting um, the team that's going to deliver that uh, kind of investment strategy. Commissioner, we've heard um, in the last several sessions of the legislature that uh, traffic is really a problem and is really an impediment to companies moving to the state or to companies remaining in the state. Now, there are so many other reasons why companies decide to leave that have to do with taxes and many other things. Um, how big an issue is transportation for attracting business and keeping business? I think the, uh, what we've learned for, uh, in the course of a business uh, job session uh, in the last session uh, and really working with uh, and interviewing businesses is that uh, transportation is important. It's not necessarily the top issue, but if it's not number one, it's number two. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's important is to connect businesses with the right transportation solutions. Um, if you look at what our infrastructure can offer, uh, we have the busiest, the most productive, the most cost-efficient rail line in the New Haven line, and it has the capacity, frankly, to grow our economy um, with an existing infrastructure in an existing urban, urban environment uh, where people can work and live and recreate and really, back to the future, develop around our urban centers. Mm -hmm. The capacity of that line alone could probably sustain most of our growth for the next 30 years if it only located in that corridor. And yet we have other corridors worthy of investment and worthy of transportation solutions, like, for instance, um, the, the, the busway into Hartford, which we'll be breaking ground on um, next month, and will bring a brand new transportation artery to get free flow travel and really reopen up an, an entire economy to the west of Hartford and beyond. It's a network that's expansive that can grow as the economy grows, and that's critical. And then uh, uh, the last major investment is the investment in the New Haven to Springfield Rail, high-speed rail line. And, and there's the 91 corridor uh, ripe for development, towns up and down that corridor prepared for transit-oriented development, already in the works, already zoned, ready to go. Uh, and that's a service that, again, we'll be breaking ground on this year uh, and for the busway service in, in two years and um, for the rail line service in 2016. So these are things that are right around the corner. Mm -hmm. But once they're in place, we'll serve for the next 50 to 100 years in terms of an infrastructure. So mm -hmm. all good things for economy, all good things for job relocation or for people, in fact, residentially, to locate in high density areas, high quality of life, good environmental, good, you know, good conditions, and, and really, we hope, a rebirth of really what was the history mm -hmm. of development in Connecticut. Jim Cameron, uh, you recently wrote a column, uh, one of your regularly scheduled uh, transportation columns, about how to get more people on board Metro North and what it will take actually to utilize the system to um, its fullest capacity. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, just for historical perspective, Metro North carries about 115,000 riders every day. It is the busiest, as the Commissioner said, busiest commuter railroad in the United States. And it has, despite the recession and despite fare increases, seen a year-over-year -year growth of 4 to 5 percent. And with the arrival of the new M8 cars, which were maybe a decade late in arriving, but they're coming in good numbers now, I think we've turned the corner. That mm -hmm. railroad is not in the crisis state that it was five or six years ago, mm -hmm. when every winter you wondered if the trains were going to run. Uh, the way to get more people on the trains uh, is to get them to the stations. And one of the biggest problems we have, although we've increased capacity on Metro North by about 15 percent with the addition of these new cars, is we haven't done anything about adding parking or intermodal bus service to get people to those train stations. 
Uh, even a town like Westport, uh, just last week, almost killed its local mass transit system running smaller buses up and down uh, uh, from downtown to the train station. So I think the real issue is we got, you know, we're blessed. I mean, the right of way that we inherited from the 1840s when that railroad was put in, a four-track right of way, you couldn't build today if you wanted to. People talk about, why don't we put a monorail down the middle of I-95? It's just not going to happen. Uh, but we do have that four-track railroad. We could increase the number of trains that we run by adding more equipment. But I think the real question is keeping fares affordable and giving the people who don't live right next to the train station access to those trains. Jim, one of the things that I always think about is um, if I wanted to take the train and I wasn't going to go all the way into New York, mm -hmm. if I wanted to get off at my job in Fairfield or Stamford or what have you, how do I get to my office then? That's a, a big question. Uh, most of the railroad riders that we have on Metro North are going in or out of New York City. Uh, we own 90 plus percent market share of the people who live in Fairfield County and go to work in New York City every day. Mm -hmm. uh, we are increasing, uh, thanks to the Commissioner's efforts, more intermodal uh, ridership, people who are going within the state, intrastate riders, so that they could go to jobs in Stanford. Um, Stanford's a good example. Stanford actually has more passengers getting off at that train station every day and going to work in Stanford than there are residents of Stanford who get on trains in Stanford and go someplace else. But Stanford is blessed with a, a variety of not only uh, state-run buses, but a, a, uh, an army of, of shuttlecraft from various corporations mm -hmm. that, that don't want to rely on the state, want to give their, their employees incentive not to be driving cars stuck on 90, 95. So they offer door-to-door -door service from Pitney Bowes to the train station or from GE down at the train station. Uh, that's the $64 question because most businesses are not located in the city centers. Uh, the urban, suburban sprawl that uh, Rich spoke of earlier has spread those office parks away from the downtown core where mass transit is. So it's tough. You, you know, if you want to do the right thing and try taking the train, great. You get off in Fairfield and then, well, where do you go from there? How do I get to my office? Yeah, I mean, that's been uh, an issue. I used to work in New Haven and lived in Westport. Um, one of the things that I was uh, interested in in your talk was um, something that's virtually disappeared, which is transportation on the water, on the yeah. river, and on right. Long Island Sound. Is there potential for that to come back, do you think, Rich? Well, I don't, I don't know, but I think potential is there. Mm -hmm. But uh, public policy at the moment, um, I don't know. We tend to treat the waterway, which used to be a, an artery of transportation, mm -hmm. it's more an obstacle to transportation today. It's something to be gotten over. Now, Long Island Sound has a lot of potential. There are several uh, services in operation, um, but I don't know if we could tap into that commuter uh, problem that, that Jim is talking about. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's definitely something that I think should be in the discussion mm -hmm. for future is, options. Commissioner, is it in the discussion? Oh, absolutely. Um, if, if we look at a, a broader perspective of mm -hmm. where the strategies need to go, um, I think we look at, at the water side. Um, there are studies going on around services from Stanford and from Bridgeport mm -hmm. um, that could ferry people along the coast or to New York or to destinations there. Um, those are studies that are underway. Um, I think we need to look at those. Uh, they can become very viable solutions for a particular market that makes that connection mm -hmm. and it can work for them. Uh, Connecticut River ferries mm -hmm. uh, are key issues um, that, that, in fact, in this last uh, budget cycle were threatened um, with, with some elimination. And, in fact, what happened was the communities rallied around those services and came out in, in droves to support them. And um, we're thrilled that we're reopening service. We've reopened the, uh, the ferry service down south. Uh, May 1st uh, weekend starts the opening of the Rocky Hill ferry. So um, they're still sustained. Mm -hmm. Oldest uh, ferry systems in the, in, the, in the country have a rich history, and we're looking to preserve those and sustain them. So I think waterborne transportation is critical. And furthermore, the other piece of that is that the state, for the first time, is engaged in a, a strategic study of uh, ports and rail connections mm -hmm. using our port infrastructures, uh, trying to find the best use uh, to maximize the public investment as well as private sector investment from the water side to the land side. And frankly, if we could do that in an effective way, there's a solution for your congestion. If we can remove 
goods off of trucks mm -hmm. along 95 and put them from water to rail, mm -hmm. I think we have a significant potential to assist in our solutions to long-term congestion relief. So I want to just go back for a second and just to mention a few things on Jim's point about the railroad and access to it. Um, we actually made some significant strides in opening up parking and access to the system in the last couple of years. Uh, I'll note that the uh, new station at Fairfield Metro is open with 1,400 spaces and we've pretty much sold the permits out already in less than a year. A uh, phenomenal story there with a great station and great utilization. Uh, West Haven, brand new station, um, should open up uh, in a year or two. Uh, we've got uh, parking uh, and transit-oriented development. Request for uh, qualifications out for Stamford to find a thousand or more new parking spaces there in the near future. Uh, and we have plans to do the same kind of investment and same expansion in New Haven. Um, so I think there's some really significant things happening there, and I'm hoping that on Earth Day um, we'll actually take title as a state to uh, the parking garage in Bridgeport. We'll open up yet a new level on that system and have yet another couple hundred parking spaces, all addressing uh, the need for expanded access to the system. So we're pleased that that, that progress is being made. Tim? Can I pick up? I, you know, sure. I, I work with the commissioner a lot. We're, we meet on a monthly basis. He is, uh, in the 15 years I've been on the commuter council, he is the sixth commissioner I have worked with, uh, and uh, I, I, I hope he's going to be there for a while because he's very pro-rail and understands it. You know, the DOT, I think, gets a bad rap, and it's called the highway department. It's much more than just that. So I'll, I'll take issue with his claim about solving or really addressing even the parking issue at the train stations. We still have, in most of the southern Fairfield County communities, a five- to eight-year waiting list for parking permits at the train stations. Who's going to move to a town like Darien or New Canaan if they have to wait eight years to get a parking permit? Um, the problem is that the DOT owns the stations, owns the parking, but they leave it up to the towns to administer as they, how they're going to price it, how they're going to allocate the permits. Uh, each of the towns feels the train station is theirs, it's not the state's. And they're always worried when the DOT comes into a community like mine in Darien, as they did a few years ago, and said, let's put a deck parking structure inside this hill berm here that no one will see it. They went nuts. It was like, oh, my God, out-of-towners are going to come and use our roads to get to our train station. <laughs> Heavens. So the landlord's going to have to get tough with the tenants, I think, yeah. and do something on that. And if I could circle back to the, to the, the waterborne issue. Yes, you know, Rich and I were talking earlier, and he commented that the first... Uh, first railroad to uh, Boston was actually the Long Island Railroad because people took the Long Island Railroad to the tip of Long Island and then caught a ferry boat up to uh, Stonington and then continued on their way up. I don't think waterborne uh, ferry boats are the solution for a number of reasons. Uh, one, uh, to make speed and compete against the railroad, uh, you have to put your terminal and your parking along the coast. You can't come up the inlets into where the downtowns are. You have to do about five miles an hour there, and then you lose the, the speed advantage. The land along the water, which is where the best place to put a high-speed ferry would be, is prohibitively expensive because it's being filled with mansions and yacht clubs. Uh, the other problem is, is that uh, you can't compete on frequency or on fares with what the railroad is going to do. Uh, the, the ferry boats in the New York City area that have tried to compete with existing rail lines have all failed. Uh, the ones that are successful are the ones that don't compete against mm -hmm. existing infrastructure and go across Long Island Sound, mm -hmm. the Bridgeport, Port Jeff, or uh, the, the New London Ferry. Mm -hmm. Even the, um, uh, the Indian casinos, which got into the high-speed uh, right. ferry They're boat building them. service, to bring uh, losers of the gamblers... <laughs> from New York City up to the casino to lose money, they couldn't do that uh, competitively. The, the high-speed ferries are the aquatic equivalent of the Concorde. I mean, and with the price of gas being what it is, you, you know, it's hard to get your lobster boat out in the water, let alone something that's guzzling gasoline to try and take commuters. So the fares would be twice as expensive. The service would not be... Uh, as frequent, I wouldn't mind taking it on a day like this, a beautiful spring day, but in the teeth of a gale or in the middle of a blizzard, I'd much rather be on the train. So, and the, the final reason I don't think ferry boats are, are the answer is the marketplace has told us that there's no, nobody out there who knows about ferry boats who wants to run a service. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that the ferry boat folks 
in New York City who have looked at any number of routes have looked up to Connecticut and done the math and said, there's no business there. And Rich has clearly pointed out there's any number of transportation initiatives that have been undertaken under private enterprise that lost their shirts. Mm -hmm. So I hope that the state doesn't get into bed with too many private ferry boat operators and end up, you know, owning a few high-speed ferries that might be good for museums, but that's about it. I want to jump onto another topic because we are going to have about 15 minutes left, and that is something that the legislature and everybody else seems to dance around, you know, for the last several years putting tolls back on the highways. And um, Jim brought out the point that, you know, we're not talking about tolls the way they used to be when we had them on our highways here. Anybody who drives out of state and has an easy pass knows that. Um, Commissioner, is there any way to avoid tolls, or are they as much a part of our future as blow wikers putting in the income tax when there was no <laughs> other way to look? Uh, I don't think tolls are things to be uh, counted on or, or avoided or anything like that at the moment. What we're in the process of is, is what I consider to be the uh, true assessment of what tolls would take to implement. And um, that really hasn't been done. Um, what we have is a history that really is a bad history about accidents around a toll plaza. And um, uh, that's not what the issue of tolls is all about. Today, we've got technology that can make tolls seamless and easy and, and, and really don't affect cars and travel. Um, but the real question is, would they work in Connecticut? How would they work in Connecticut? Um, where would you put them? What are the issues about pricing and diverting to other routes and congestion and those issues? Uh, they really haven't been fully investigated, and um, for that reason, uh, we uh, successfully applied and received two grants, um, one for studying uh, what we call value pricing and, and I tolling. And I wanted to have you talk about that uh -huh, value on pricing. On Route 95, on I-95, and the other one uh, on Route 84. One uh, potential al allocation or application would be uh, if we need to and when we need to reconstruct the Hartford Viaduct to be able to toll a facility, if you will, to pay for that new facility. Um, otherwise, tolls today are restricted in that you can't use tolls to pay for maintaining existing roadways. Um, so what we looked at, have to look at is, number one, what, what could tolls be? Um, can they be for new capacity or better management of traffic? Um, uh, how do they get applied so that there's uh, a measured and balanced impact um, on all users as well as on all routes? Mm -hmm. um, those are tough questions. They require uh, investigation of data and travel patterns, um, uh, a lot of behavioral studies to see what people would do, uh, and then there's a lot of technology to look at, and how would we implement it. Um, tolls have shown that they can serve a purpose in funding projects or in long-term maintenance of our infrastructure, and obviously we had them once. Um, our question really is, I think, longer term about what role do tolls play? They may be, for example, um, used to pay for a portion of a new highway, and that's a strategy that's moving along for the potential uh, construction of Route 11, the missing link of Route 11. Uh, may not pay for the whole project, but it may be a tool to pay for that. Um, so what we're committed to is an honest investigation, sharing that publicly um, with all uh, modes and all people and all uh, constituents so that when we're finished in, in, a, in a year or two with this investigation, appropriate decisions can be made. Now, what are those? Um, the real decision is, the state of Connecticut is faced with a, a rather extraordinary, well-used, heavily used infrastructure. But it has a long history, right? It's, it's ancient. Um, and we are one of the uh, proud owners of 100 years old facilities um, in the Northeast that have harsh winters, lots of chemicals and things on the facilities, and short construction season. Um, and with that comes obligations for a huge backlog of maintenance and repair. Mm -hmm. And so there's 5,000 or so DOT and local bridges. There's 350 rail bridges. There's a rail right-of-way in Catenary that's 100 years old and a signal system that's 100 years old. And all that has to be taken care of. And we are the owners of that responsibility, and we share the stewardship of taxpayer resources, federal and state, to take care of those by setting priorities, making judgment calls. Where tolls fit in that as a funding stream is a good question. It may be the right answer, it may not be the right answer. But I will say that our needs in terms of the current infrastructure and our appetite for new is extraordinary. 
There isn't a place that I go that someone says, where's my railroad? Where's my station? Where's my bus route? Where's my highway? I want this, I want that, I want that. Because you know what? Transportation drives everything. It is essential to everyone. And the better it is, the better our lifestyles are going to be. The better off we're going to be as a state economically and competitively. Um, so as we sort through the needs about an old infrastructure and what we have to do when, there's a price tag that comes with that. When we look at what the expansion and new opportunities are, there are huge opportunities. And there's a price tag that comes with that. Tolls will fit in the equation of how do we raise money. But I, but I want to re, recast the argument about any funding scenario. It's not just about we got old bridges, we've got to fix them. Um, we can't fail to realize that transportation has many, many, many economic impacts that we really need to put together because I believe that a transportation dollar spent returns many times that in benefits, whether that's jobs or if that's quality of life or if that's health. Uh, you know, folks who take the train and walk to and from it are known to be healthier. If we, if we could account for the health cost reductions, mm -hmm. um, I think we could have an equation that shows probably the biggest multiplier of a federal or state tax dollar spent. So I think our needs are extraordinary. Tolling may be a solution. There may be others. There's lots of ways to generate money. It will not be an easy argument. We've got a lot of things to do. Uh, my challenge and what I'll take on is a responsibility for translating transportation dollar investments into the benefits for everyone in the state of Connecticut mm -hmm. and in the region. Mm -hmm. Because frankly, a lot of travel in Connecticut goes through. Mm -hmm. um, and as I look at it, you know, at the moment, we'll be one of the only states in the Northeast that is not tolling I-95. And at some point, that's going to be, you know, a dilemma for us to face as well. Hopefully, we can deliver in a few years the right tools, the right decision making, and make the right choices about whether tolls do or don't play a role in this mix of what we need to get done in transportation. We have about uh, 10 minutes. Does anybody have a question that they'd like to ask our panelists? Yes, in the back. A couple of them. Hi, my name is Rico. Um, one, are we looking, like, why did we pick the Massachusetts developer versus, like, a Connecticut developer for that, the bus project? Because um, I think of employees who actually are working in Connecticut. They pay the tax dollars to help fund this. I know this stuff comes from federal. But, I mean, I think something as in here, we should be focusing on Connecticut developers. Or do you guys take a percentage, make sure that it has to be employees from Connecticut um, to go back into tax revenue and stuff? And then another thing, as in tolls and some ideas, like, have you guys looked in what San Diego has done of recent, how they expanded the carpool lane and the toll system, which I think would be a great use of having, having to expand? the freeways, um, and maybe speeding up also some of the speed limits, like on Route 2, like instead of being 55, it's pretty much a straight shoot, going up to 65 miles an hour and some other stuff like that. So there's okay. three portion okay. question there. Commissioner, you want I, to I'll, I'll try to be brief, uh, because there's a lot of questions there. First, um, uh, when we're talking about a busway and the fact that one of the contractors that was selected was uh, Walsh Construction, that's a Massachusetts firm. Um, all the other contracts are Connecticut companies. And, and, and frankly, our experience with Walsh as a construction company is that the majority, if not almost all of the employees, are Connecticut employees. Uh, the management firm is from out of state, but they employ people locally because it's an efficient way to drive a project. And they've demonstrated that on the Q Bridge project. They demonstrated that on the Moses Wheeler project. And in the end, um, this is a, a project funded with discretionary federal dollars and has other federal dollars in it. Federal guidelines say you pick the lowest qualified bidder. And I can't tell them, I can't prejudge, and I can't preset whether that's Connecticut or not. The best news is that out of first four contracts, three out of four have gone to Connecticut firms because they came in with the best price and best value. And it happens that Walsh that won the other bid is out of state, but I'm, I'm comfortable that they have uh, terrific outreach to all of Connecticut companies, to minority companies. We've done a lot of outreach to make sure that the labor pool is as local as can be, and we're comfortable with that. 
Um, in terms of, uh, let's talk about tolling quickly, and this is the value pricing question. How do you encourage carpooling, add a little capacity, get some speed at different times of day, maybe price, you know, a toll lane higher in the peak than in the off-peak, but people can go faster. Um, I'm not, but I'm not an advocate for raising the speed limit to 70 miles an hour. They already go 70 at the 55 miles an hour. <laughs> I, I, I'd be kind of afraid of, 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 of making it higher. And the last question, I'm sorry. What they did with the tolls is they created the, like two carpool lanes right. going on each side. And so people who are not carpooling could actually pay to yeah, be right. in that carpool lane. That's correct. Yeah. And so I was thinking there could be some areas to help expand the freeway, reduce some congestion, and call those Lexus lanes. Was that? Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lexus lanes. Those that <laughs> really want to get there fast, yeah. fast and have the five bucks, we'll take it. Yeah, so the working Joe in his uh, Subaru <laughs> is driving along. Did we have a question up here? Do you have a question, sir? Yes, yeah. over here. You mentioned in, in um, uh, regarding the ports about the, the key and the necessity of linking ports to land-based transportation. How do you see Bradley Airport fitting into that, and what kind of projects do you guys have up your sleeve to have Bradley those sa of, uh, have those same connections? Yeah. Sure. Um, well, let, let's just talk uh, briefly about Bradley, mm -hmm. um, and then a little bit about the, the, the good side of Bradley and, and the connections to Bradley. Uh, so uh, a terrific, I think, action taken by the legislature was to create an airport authority um, so that very shortly the DOT will not be responsible for Bradley anymore. Um, uh, that's not to say that, I, that we haven't done a good job. I think Bradley is a, a gem. And coming from the New York region for all my life, traveling through Bradley is a breeze and a wonderful experience. And I wouldn't give it up and go back to the New York region, don't tell them that, but to take air travel. It's a terrific airport. And if you've been there lately, I think you've seen some terrific improvements. A new terminal, re-outfitted. Uh, I've been at more events to open up a martini bar, a wine bar, and a sandwich shop. I mean, there's great <laughs> stuff happening there. Um, new service from, you know, from JetBlue and from Southwest and new airlines, and, uh, and that's a credit to a good airport. But the authority's been created for purposes of expanding the scope of the airport, expanding its development capability, looking into how do we make Bradley a far more uh, driver of the economy in that region. Uh, economic enterprise zones to try to build that and working on practically, I think, another back to the future story. Bradley used to be a center for goods movement and it is not anymore. Um, and we need to restore that. Um, the question about connection of Bradley to rail, um, uh, I think we, we have to take that in two parts. The first is, um, as we build the high-speed rail connection, the intercity line from New Haven to Springfield, there will be a dedicated shuttle to the airport. It will be with bus first because it can be done quickly, cheaply, and, and can meet every single flight and every single train and do that cost effectively. Um, in the future, we're looking, we will look at whether a rail connection to the airport makes sense. Um, and I guess I would say this, the DOT, I think, has a pretty good track record of, if it makes sense, we'll do it. It's not that we predetermine an outcome about a particular mode. That's why there's a busway to the west of Hartford and not a rail line for the moment. It was an agnostic study about how to fix travel and a busway came out as the answer. If rail connections to Bradley make sense, either for freight or passenger, that answer will come out and we'll invest in that. It won't be tomorrow, because that's on that long list of wants and not needs necessarily. But I think we'll look into that and, and hopefully make the right choices. I'm convinced that the board of directors for the new airport authority, and I'm one of those members, so I have to, have to you know, I'm on that side, um, has an absolute committed uh, dedication to expanding passenger travel and freight travel, as well as development around Bradley Airport, uh, and working with the communities and the Bradley uh, Development League. I think there's a, a huge possibility there. I'm really excited about it. It brings me back to my first days at New Jersey Transit. I was fifth on the payroll of a brand new fledgling organization. Now there's a new airport authority in Connecticut and I'm one of the first members, founding members of that and I'm looking forward to huge things happening at Bradley, uh, both in terms of people and goods movement. I have time for one more question. Anybody have a question over here? Yes. Kind of cheating. It's not so much a question, but just a comment. Uh, Rico and Mark and myself are all members of HYPE's Public Policy Committee. HYPE, if you're not familiar, is Hartford Young Professionals and Entrepreneurs. So I just want to take the opportunity to thank you for being here 
thank the Old State House for hosting this in CTN because we're finding among the 3,500 members that we talk to in the greater Hartford region, transportation is a really big deal to us. It's a really big deal. I personally, and you know, Mark has lived in Poland and my family's from Japan, so I'm spoiled by bullet trains and you know, I used to live in Portland, Oregon. So I've, I'm seeing similarities in the conversation that was referred to there in Portland as happening in the late 80s. I-84 is also their highway there that they did a uh, light rail instead. So I just want to thank you for being here and bringing this conversation to light. I know it's been uh, illuminating for me. And just to know that we are really, really, this is really important to us. It comes up every time we talk about policy issues. So thank you, and I'm excited. Oh, that's good to hear. Go, go for bus. I'm really trying to change the conversation <laughs> around bus and biking. You know, because that's that's paving the way, not to use the transportation pun, but paving the way for rails. So just thank you very much, and thanks, Mark and Rico, for being here. I'm going to let each of the panelists just have uh, two minutes for a closing remark. That was great. Thank you. <laughs> well, so if I can um, start. Um, one of the things I'd like to emphasize, and I've been hearing it today and, and listening to the commissioner, you know, we talk about history, and it is a guide, and it is, I think, a very useful guide to present-day discussions. But the history of Connecticut transportation was just a helter-skelter uh, series of events. It was the main distinction to be made between then and now is that we have the option to study, to plan out. We have a more centralized mm -hmm. focus. Uh, these folks were just dealing with new technologies as they came along. The private inv uh, investors were building to the point of overbuilding, then consolidating, going bust, then back and forth. We have, as the commissioner said today, a lot more options mm -hmm. available to us. And uh, it, we seem to be going in the right direction to study those options, pick the ones that make the most sense for today in light of the history that brought us here. Kim? Coming back to the old state house is like coming home for me. I used to work here mm. early in my broadcast journalism career, not in this building, but down, down the road. I moved back to Connecticut with my new wife to raise a family, and we chose Connecticut because of its proximity to good transportation to get me in and out of New York City and up and down the, the Northeast Corridor on Amtrak. Uh, a lot has changed over the years, but a lot has not changed. And I think that some of the, the riders on Metro North, some of the people stuck in I-95, uh, you know, pound their stealing wheel, uh, pound the chair in front of me and say, why doesn't somebody do something? Why can't we fix this? Uh, I think a lot of time we have overstudied things instead of making a decision. The legislature is loath to do the right thing if they know it's politically unpopular, like tolls. I think that's an inevitability. I think that the busway that you're going to see here in Hartford is a tremendous step forward. I know that some of my rail fan friends have been trying to second guess that and poo poo it uh, for a long time, but I think it's a great step forward. If the ridership is there and it proves that it can be expanded as it has in other cities that have busways, sure, then we can put rail in. But let's start with the busway, which is something you can build quickly and find that that ridership is there. So I'm saying what about the future? As I said, I think on the Metro North side of things, we've turned the corner. We have moved from every winter being a matter of peril to uh, a confidence that commuters have, if, if they can get to the station and find parking, that the train will be there and they'll probably be able to afford it. So we live in such a small state, but I think that uh, we have to do a lot to get involved on a public policy level to turn out and involve yourself with the decision makers, your local elected officials, your state rep, your state senator, let them know how you feel on these issues so they can let the commissioner know what the, the voters and the constituents are saying. Thank you. Commissioner, let you have the last word. Why, thank you. Um, what a privilege. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and to share a little bit about what's going on, and I appreciate the history. Um, uh, we learn a lot from history, and a lot of what we're doing today is really nothing but a return to, the, to the, our past and to roots that really made Connecticut great. Um, understanding that, it's a challenge for me and for the department and for the state to direct the resources to really regain that position that Connecticut had. Um, but I'm, I'm thrilled to be here at this time. Um, for more than one reason, but I've got uh, the support of a legislature and administration um, and right now funding um, to advance what is just an incredible investment strategy in Connecticut. When I think about 
a $2 billion Q bridge being built and $2 billion going into the New Haven line infrastructure and rolling stock and more than a billion dollars going into it, a new busway and a new um, high-speed rail corridor all at once. At the same time that we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars maintaining what we already own is the beginning of a future. And the idea that we could be part of that today is really exciting for me. I'm not sure that I've got 30 years like my last career to see it all done, <laughs> but I have huge opportunities, I think, to try to shape a vision, building off the past, and it gets to me in the end. The success of transportation gets down to the individual. It's about making sure that we're listening to everybody and serving the individual, whether that's on a, the bus that they're on each day or the train that they're on or driving every day or a constituent that's paying taxes for somebody else to invest in a system because it's the right thing for the economy or it's the right thing for basic mobility. We need to listen. We need to be responsive. And if I can bring anything to the table as a commissioner now, it's I think we've got a great legacy, a great chance at shaping the future, but as we do that, we want to do it in a way that listens to our customers and responds and demonstrates that commitment to each and every person in this state and all the people that pass through, and then we'll be successful. So customer service to me is the hallmark, and we're going to be that kind of an organization. I look forward to delivering projects, not personally, with a terrific team of professionals that are out there every single day uh, dedicated to doing the right thing. Um, but it's great to be here because it's great cutting ribbons, and I love celebrating great things. <laughs> and there's a lot of that that's going to happen, mark my word. It's going to be a great couple of years in the next few, and I hope to share it with everybody here and invite you to all those great openings and, and then to use the systems. So thank you for the thank opportunity to be here much. and to be with everybody thank on the panel. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Tabor Conover, and on behalf of the Old State House, I'm delighted to have all of you here today. And I would ask that you please fill out your evaluations to let us know your feedback. And I would invite you to join us for some other exciting programs coming down the road. This Friday, we're very, very excited and honored to have a traveling World War I exhibit entitled Honoring Our History. It was put together by the curators and historians at the National World War I Museum. And the exhibit itself is located in a, um, an 18-wheel big rig, who, which will be on site here at the Old State House all day on Friday from 10 to 5. And um, we also will have a small accompanying um, exhibit with um, items from World War I on loan to us from the Connecticut State Library. And so we invite you to come back for that. And on um, May the 23rd, we will be recognizing the 350th anniversary of the Connecticut Charter, and we'll have a program here, another lunchtime program at noon. So we hope you'll join us for those programs. And we would invite you, if you would like to watch the program again, um, it has been taped for CTN for the Connecticut Network, and will be on view on the network, as well as available to be downloaded from our website, which is on CTN, um, our website on and uh, so we hope to see you soon, and thank you again for coming, and thank you to our panelists and our speakers. Yes.